Well, welcome everybody. Episode 39 of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. And I've got a great show today. We're going to be chatting about a very, very interesting topic for this particular time. And the title is, If You Don't Pivot, You May Blow It, with Peter Crew Brown. Now, who is Peter? Peter is a chartered accountant and business advisor who helps business owners get their lives back by providing clarity. He does this by helping to develop strategic plans for five years, one year, and 90 days. He uses his signature PAIR, P-A-I-R, program. It addresses four areas of greatest frustration to ambitious owners working on their business, namely planning, accountability, implementation, and review. Peter offers a complimentary strategy session to curious business owners. So if anybody's interested in taking him up on that, please feel free. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm really excited about this because we're going to be chatting about working on your business as opposed to in your business, lessons we have learned from the lockdown, and how can we future-proof our business for any situation um, moving forward. So Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Darren. I'm uh, really excited to spend some time with you. Fantastic. I mean, in, in our previous discussions, I love, you know, all the, the, the content that we're going to cover. So I'm really excited to get into the Q&A. But before we do, maybe tell us a bit about you. Um, so for those of you who know accents, um, you probably <laughs> recognize um, some South African in, in my voice. Um, I arrived in Australia 33 years ago. Uh, I was recently married. Uh, since that time, I've uh, had uh, two kids. Wow. Uh, my daughter's 30, currently living in London and uh, struggling a little bit with isolation that they yeah. have there. Yeah. Uh, and my youngest son uh, is 27. He works in um, funds management in the city, uh, living the dream with all of his mates, uh, working <laughs> hard and playing harder. <laughs> As they do in that industry. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic, mate. And so you've been in business in this area, especially for how long? Um, I've been working as a business advisor to SMEs since early 2003. Wow. Um, the more specific business advisory, uh, and I dare say, you know, with an element of coaching um, for three years. So the more holistic wow. approach has been three years. But prior to that, given that I'm a charge of account by profession, a lot of it was more sort of uh, finance advisory slash uh, virtual CFO type work. So gotcha. 17 years in total. Wow, so you've seen a lot, you've seen it all. Yeah, and all that time working with SMEs. So I do right. regard myself as uh, a recent, I guess, um, yeah, I say expert in uh, many aspects of SME land. Oh, fantastic. Looking forward to hearing more about your experience. But I thought uh, before we jump share. in and get more detailed about what you do, I mean, I love that, and it's, it's just, it's almost a cliche, we, we hear about it so much, working on your business as opposed to working in your business. I mean, I've heard that for years, but it's something that we all fall victim to, especially solopreneurs and I suppose anybody really. How do we ensure that we continue to find time and mindset to make sure we're looking at working on our business and not falling into the trap of always just letting the business take us for a, for a run. Yeah. And I, you know, it's kind of interesting. I met up with a client of mine, uh, a very impressive lady who works in the city. Um, and um, she's got a $10 million turnover business wow. in construction. Wow. And she was saying to me, you know, even with a business of that size, she finds she's spending too much time putting out fires. Wow. And that's, you know, essentially what people yeah. are on about. They don't have time to focus on, on the things that are going to take the business forward. Yeah. So just um, to answer your question uh, specifically, um, Darren, um, statistically, companies that spend meaningful time working on their businesses um, achieve on average a three times um, greater profitability than the industry peers. So um, we'll define what working on the business is, but if you do spend time working on your business, there are statistics, well-supported statistics that say your profitability will be three times greater. Three uh, times, you know, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and, you know, I would also go on to say that 
we all have heard at different times the failure rates of businesses. Yep. The statistic I've heard most often um, is that only 20% of businesses um, last for more than five years. Yeah. And um, I think um, the differentiator between those that last and those that don't is often to do with working on the business. And um, for me, there's two essential uh, elements um, or reasons, if you like, for this conundrum of you know why some businesses don't yeah. um, don't succeed succeed, and and I believe that the two components are the absence of both a business plan and the time for the owner to devote to the activities required to to work on the business. Yeah. Um, a great starting point, I reckon, for anyone looking to you know move in that direction, if they like the idea of um, you know, uh, tripling their profitability over time is um, is to create a business plan. Yep. Um, and um, I guess, again, looking at some statistics, there's an organization called B-Star that does an annual survey of SMEs in Australia. And again, this 20% statistic, they found in, and they do a survey every year that only 20% of businesses have a business plan. Wow. And are these the same 20% that survive five years? I guess yeah. no one knows, but yeah. I believe there's a strong correlation between those groups of, of business owners. Um, I guess the second part, as I say, is I think the business plan is a critical part. The other part is uh, having available time. Yeah. There's a, a very well-known consultant called Stephen Covey. Yes, um, I've read who wrote book, the book seven about the Seven Habits yep. yeah, of Highly Successful People. He introduced a concept um, back in the 80s um, about um, the two essential components of, of time management, and those are urgent and important. Right. And essentially, um, you know, his, um, his approach, which, you know, he, he's created a time management matrix, matrix, dictates that business owners should only work on things that are important. So whether they're urgent or not urgent, if they're not important, you should not work on them. Wow. Um, so it's, I guess what happens for most business owners is they spend a lot of time working on things that are urgent and either important or not important. Right. So anything that's not important, you shouldn't work on. And I think a thing these days where people spend a lot of time is anything to do with social media, things to do with emails. Yep. Yes, sure. There's some important emails, but our ideas are 80% of emails that business owners get, uh, that probably they shouldn't be dealing with. Yeah, um, I'd agree with that. And, and so the bottom line is, unless they can free up time, they're never going to work on the non-urgent things that are important. And the non-urgent things that are important, the biggest category of, of, if you like, activities in that sphere are anything to do with strategy, big picture thinking, um, looking at trends in the business, analysis, you know, all of the maybe. things. Yeah. And... Um, it's kind of interesting. There was a fellow, um, I think he's still alive, um, Michael Gerber, who wrote the book called The right. E-Myth Revisited. Yep. Yep. Uh, still one of my favorite books. And he talks about successful business owners needing to wear three hats, the technician, the um, entrepreneur, and the manager. And what happens is anyone coming into a new business, he's learned to do his trade. He comes into the business, he does his trade, but he doesn't do anything else. And so all he's done is bought himself a job. Yes. And not a, 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 and it's even worse than that because he's now in a job that he only gets paid if there's money left over. That's At least right. when you work for someone else, you typically get paid all the time. That's right. So and he, and he has not, a bit more admin as well. <laughs> yeah. So unless an owner can wear all three hats at different times, they're going to be stuck in the technician space and all they're going to do is be fighting fires and working in the business. Gotcha. So the owner has to free up time, create a business plan. And to me, if they can um, do those two central things, free, getting more planning happening, get more time to do the planning, then they're going to give themselves a much greater chance of, of elevating by working on the business and uh, succeeding. Fantastic. I mean, I'm just, and I'm, while I'm listening to you, I'm kind of thinking in my head, I wonder what the percentage or the relationship or the ratio would be between working on the business and working in the business is there such a thing to, to think about or is it very subjective look to be i say to owners as a minimum 
you want to spend half a day a week. I mean, that is the absolute minimum. That's four hours. Half a day. I think um, if, you know, the absolute ideal is um, probably two days a week, 40% of your time. Wow. Um, and that's born out by another author called a guy called Michael McCallowitz, right. who writes a book called Clockwork, amongst others. Yeah. And he talks about the four Ds. And, you know, one of them is doing, and the final one is designing. And he says you should spend, the owner should be spending that 40% of time in this design activity. Yep. And for in his world, design is like the big picture stuff, you know, how you create uh, the business and the structures rather than doing the work. So I think, yeah, I mean, the ultimate is around about that 40%, two days a week, and that might be four half days. But um, all those, wow. the big players in businesses, I think, you succeed. You know, they've got the systems working well, they've got a good staff of people. Um, and you know, the business pretty much runs itself. Wow, and that, that kind of touches on a very in, in, interesting point as well is the point of outsourcing. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of people can get caught up in the trap of doing everything, and I do this myself, doing everything myself when yes. I really should and could be outsourcing certain things to other people to free myself to actually work on the business. Yeah, you know, or I just spend more and more time working on the business and work ridiculous hours, but. I think there's a lot to be said about outsourcing, so people should absolutely. And, and um, just you know, some of the approaches that I've seen to take up on what you've mentioned, Darren, is that um, there's, there's this idea that you you know, if you're serious about freeing up your time, you've got to be quite deliberate about it. You can't yeah. just talk about it and say, "Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm going to do it." Mm -hmm. You need to change your habits which we all know is hard to do. Yeah. And a good starting point, and it's something I do with clients I work with, is um, I've got a template where they do a time audit. So they keep the, a record of their time in sort of half hour increments for at least one week. If they don't get a meaningful trend, do it for two weeks and work out what the main activities they're working on is. Yep. And then say, how would my ideal week look if I were to devote 40% of my time to working on the business? Wow. So what they've got to do is they've got to say, which of those activities in that time audit can I either delegate, um, eliminate, or automate? Yep. Those are yep. kind of the things you can do. Uh, and so you've got to say, if I want to free up time to find two days or you know 40% of my time, I'm going to have to get rid of 40% of what I'm currently doing. So yeah. you do a time audit, work out what they are. Those sort of uh, non-important activities should then be parked or you know those things that I mentioned done with them. Yep. And then uh, the ideal is to create an ideal diary to allocate specific times of the week when you're going to do each of the activities, but most importantly, the working on the business, those 16 hours or 20 hours, how many, many hours you work, uh, a day times two, so you might find, you know, uh, let's say in the standard working day, although not many people do that anymore, <laughs> at least 16 hours a, a week, put it in the diary, and that's an important appointment. It's as yes. important as, as any customer meeting you have, because if you don't devote time to it, nothing's going to change. Yep, fascinating. And so you have to be religious. About yeah, you've got to be very, uh, very deliberate with how you um, use your time, because we all know you can typically only do one thing or another. And yeah. if you're doing one thing and it's not a productive or the best use of your time, you're denying yourself the opportunity of doing the better thing. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. I mean, we can talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> yeah. The great, you know, the, the interesting thing is it, this is common sense, but yeah, common yeah. sense so is not easy. easily, it's not always easily applied. Yeah. And it's always easy as well to fall into the trap of, I know my business, only I can do this. Absolutely. There's always someone else that can do it the same if you train them, if not better than you, but you have to give yeah. up that control. And that's something yeah. that's very difficult to do. I think there's also an element, Darren, uh, I mean, I do agree with you that people typically default back to the areas of work uh, that comes most easily to them yeah, yeah. or even things they enjoy. And I'm not saying you should be working on things you don't enjoy, but you know, you shouldn't only be doing routine work the stuff that um, is easy. You know, yeah. we all know that being successful is hard. And, you know, there's a, a saying, it's become a bit of a cliche about you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> and you don't get uncomfortable doing easy stuff, right? That's right. Yeah. So I always say to people, if you're doing things that are challenging all the time, you know, eating the frog, that Brian yeah. Tracy thing, <laughs> um, and constantly challenging yourself, 
yeah. you're going to be above everyone else because you're going to be doing the, the hard the hard yards and you're going to get the good outcomes yeah and you're going to get used to being agile and yeah. challenging yourself and living you know not not confront uh, being able to confront fear and you know all those things and not just running away and doing the things that come easily and put bury your head in the sand yeah and learning the hard lessons that you need to 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 be different yeah you, know, to you need to make mistakes to to grow yeah yeah fantastic um now, that brings us to a really interesting point. I mean, right now in this situation, a lot of people are changing what they do. They have to, they're having to reevaluate what's happening to their business. And we're hearing this word and seeing this word pivot. Everybody's pivoting. Everybody's thinking about pivoting. What are your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, um, it's quite <laughs> interesting you asked that question. Um, I guess I'm a little cynical about the whole idea of, the term pivot. I think yep. uh, some terms found their way into you know all the stuff we read on LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn is primarily, in my experience, uh, consultants, coaches, uh, you know, mentors. There's a lot of people uh, providing their opinions, and people come up with these terms, mm. and they then become you know, um, I guess, uh, consultant speak. And I think yeah. pivots the current sort of buzzword. Yeah, uh, you know, in the old days, it was it might have been words like leadership and quality and yeah. and teamwork, but pivot seems to be the go-to word. So I, I'm I, look, I I know what people are trying to say, but I, I think that it conjures up very dramatic change. And I, m my sense is that uh, aspects of what businesses are doing are going to have to change, um, but I also believe that these changes were happening anyway. There's been so much disruption with the, you know, the advance, advance of technology that, um, you know, this is probably going to speed up some of that change, but I think it's happening anyway. And I think a lot of the, the changes will be uh, efficiencies, but it, they won't necessarily mean that most businesses need to change their core business. Yep. Um, so I like to think of what's going to happen more as business reinventing themselves. Uh, in other words, you know, keeping what's good, not throwing the baby out of the bath water, but looking at better ways of doing things and, and, you know, doing research and finding out, you know, are there new opportunities? Can I disrupt my industry? And, you know, by disrupting the industry, that's not necessarily a pivot brought, around, brought about by the lockdown, yeah. but it is a pivot and all businesses are looking to pivot anyway, because we all hear about the likes of Airbnb and, uh, and Uber, you know, two of the best examples of right. disruption. That's and right. so pivot is maybe another word for disruption. And it's, and it's just a little bit trendy at the moment, I think. Yeah. And it's also very, a little ambiguous because pivoting yeah. could mean totally changing your offering and doing something yes. totally new, or it could mean yeah. just tweaking things or adding, adding another offering to your existing offering. So that word exactly. pivot can be a little dangerous. Um, yeah, I agree. And, yeah. and generalize because it's very, very, uh, you don't know exactly what it, what it means. So Darren, I'll, I'll put a question back to you. Sure. What does the word pivot mean to you in a broader sense? Yeah, if like someone me, says, are you going to pivot your life as opposed to your business? What does yeah, that mean? Like for me, when I hear pivot, I hear in general sense, change. Yeah. Almost change. leave what you leave, exactly. what you've been doing behind and do some, something yeah, exactly. else. It means, means change. And, and that's how change. I see it too. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think of, you know, a term like reinvention is yep. a better way. It's like, or disruption. It's, you know, how yeah. do you do what you're doing differently rather than, you know, stop being a plumber and become an electrician. Exactly. To me, that's almost what a pivot is. Exactly. So that's why, yeah. like you, I, I don't quite know what it means. And I think it's, it's a good consultant's term. Um, and it almost suggests that you're cool and you, and you with, with, you know, yeah. what's going on. And it's a little but dangerous. What does it mean? Yeah. What does it mean? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, nice. so in terms of where we are now, yeah, how can we learn from the lockdown, if we want to call it the lockdown or this this period in our lives, and what's the best way for us to take action? Well, look, um, being a little smart, one thing I've learned from the lockdown personally is how fragile our lives are. Mm -hmm. You know, something happens on the other side of the planet. And seven point, I think our population is 7.6 billion in the world now. Yeah. The whole of the world's population goes, goes into a tailspin. Yep. So, you know, I guess it just reinforces to me, you know, we live in a global community now and events well beyond our control can happen at any time. 
you know, people say this is a black swan event, which I think yeah. is defined as one in a hundred years. I don't know about that. I mean, you look at SARS, you look at mad car yeah. disease, you look at all these other things, you know, There's they seem to so happen every 10 years. Sure. Other, other depressions and recessions. I mean, you know, yeah. So I think this could become a more uh, common uh, occurrence in our lives, you know, mm -hmm. that we have major events impacting the world because, you know, if one person sneezes, the whole world kind of gets affected because we, we are so global. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the thing is we need to learn to live with this type of disruption, you know, these dramatic changes in our lives because I think they're going to happen more and more often. Yep. Um, I guess in terms of some of the um, ways to take action, um, some of the things I've, I've been recommending to you know my community, I've got a newsletter and I put out um, uh, three ideas for, um, for um, you know, um, initiatives to improve your business in this uncertain time. And some of the things I've come up with, and, and this first one won't surprise you, is prepare a business plan. Yeah. You know, it's like you yeah. should, every, I guess self-respecting business owner should prepare a business plan yeah. or a strategic plan. You know, different people call them different things. Um, at least once a year. So you know, most more uh, mature businesses have a planning cycle, and they do you know a major exercise once a year. I would say if you are currently doing planning, uh, don't wait you know three or six months, however long it is, until your next cycle uh, to do your next you know your update of your of your plan. Yeah. Do it yeah. now because there's yeah. been a big change. And you don't just wait until it's it's the year end or the time of year. If you've got a change in circumstances, it's a great time to do a business plan. If you've never done one, again, what I said before, if you want the extraordinary profits, you want your business to be different, do a business plan. So I, I, to me, it's a plan. It's all about planning. Yeah. Um, I, might just I might just jump in there for a second, Peter. Sure. That's always a word that's also quite general, a business plan. I mean, sure. Business plans can be very extensive. They can be very yeah. simple. What What's your take on what's a business plan that's going to be effective? Well, um, yeah, a business plan approach that I think any business can easily do, which doesn't take a lot of um, a lot of time, and is 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 um, I guess couched in everyday terms. Um, is um, an approach that uh, I, I've used successfully in other companies, and it's actually been endorsed. It's a kind of a similar approach to a fellow called uh, Patrick Lencioni, who wrote a very successful book called The Advantage. Okay. And in it, he says there's six essential questions. Right. And if you can document these questions in a playbook, in other words, you know, this is the reference that you share with everyone in the company, uh, that will go a long way to giving you a sense of identity and just to let everyone know that if you want to work in this environment, this is the way we, we do things around here. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, it's a very basic, basic approach. And it's something that, you know, an organization could knock over in half a day, maybe yeah. a day to do it real justice. Okay. And, and the questions just quickly are, first of all, why do we exist? Yeah. And that's, you know, around the purpose statement. We've all, well, many of us have heard of a guy called Simon Sinek, yeah. uh, start with why. Yep. Uh, a great read for anyone. You know, what's the true purpose of you being there? And if you don't have that, um, you know, that uh, deep um, purpose, it's difficult to know what's important, yeah. you know, what, what, what got you into this. Yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, how do we behave? What's acceptable? Um, are you, you know, do you have clear values and are you recruiting people whose values are aligned to yours? Yeah. And again, uh, Patrick Lencioni has come up with these three uh, what he thinks are uh, important traits for the ideal team player. And those are essentially being hungry, being humble, and being smart. And mm -hmm. smart is like EQ, you know, yep. rather than uh, super intelligent. Yep. And it's kind of interesting, we think about hungry, humble, and smart. If you've got the combination of those three traits, you're likely to be the type of uh, person that um, any team would want. Right. Uh, the next thing is, uh, what do we do? And that's really just a simple definition. I mean, you read, read out earlier, you know, my two line of, you know, but who I am and what I do. So it's just coming up with something that um, you clear about and that you can discuss with people. This is the core um, offer that I do. You know, this is the play, place I play. Uh, the next thing is, how will we succeed? So that's, if you like, the fourth element of, of a, um, a high-level plan. And these are, if you like, the strategic anchors. 
And uh, two of the essential components that I like to think about is, uh, you know, we will win by. So what are the, the key activities um, uh, or services you're going to provide uh, to differentiate yourself? And, and the other um, broad area where we will play. So we will win by and where we play. Where, where we play is, you know, what markets, uh, what segments. So what's your kind of avatar yep. or, you know, your ideal client? Um, so that, you know, those questions, that fourth area is, is the strategy piece. That's the three to five year sort of uh, perspective. Um, the next component of, you know, a um, summary business plan uh, is um, what what's important right now. And these are typically your one year goals. Yep. So just being clear, you know, what are the key goals? And I would say to people, don't come up with more than five objectives for the next right. 12 months. Yep. So these are just the high level the main things you want to achieve in the business, it might be, uh, you know, put in place um, a new CRM. That yep. might be one of them. Okay. Another one might be, um, you know, lift the profitability of the company by, um, you know, um, from 10% to 15%. Yeah. Uh, or, open or, up a new market. Uh, well, move yeah, from, open, open up, up a new, new market, market in another state or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, so expect what regions you're going to go into. So what are those key initiatives? You know, or it might be to um, create a um, um, you know full database of documented systems. Yep. You know, anything that's substantial that you're going to do over the period of a year. Uh, so you come up with those four, uh, those five objectives, and then the sub points underneath each of those objectives will have that old, um, I guess, the smart goals. You know, the quantifiable things um, that you need to say. Well, what's the measure of success? How do I know if I've achieved those things? So that's very much the 12 month time frame. Okay. That fifth point is what's most important right now. And then the final point is um, who must do what? That's the final question, the sixth question. And that's all about you know accountability and making sure that, okay, we've decided these are the things that we need to do to accomplish this, um, uh, the, you know, the one year goals, what's, which is the, the fifth question. Uh, we need to make sure that every aspect of that it's documented, we've got detailed action plans, who's going to do the, the work, when they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it. Perfect. So until such time, we've got the big picture, which is the first question, um, why we exist, how do we behave, um, and you know what we do, which is the enduring stuff, that's you know the, the long-term stuff. Those are the first three questions. The next question is how we will succeed. That's your three to five strategy. Yep. This is all kind of cascading down. The fifth item is, What's most important right now, as in the next 12 months, and the okay. final thing is what 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 must we do? Um, right. So, in other words, specifically, we've got all the big picture stuff that needs to convert to action. Otherwise, the plan never goes anywhere. Great, awesome. So, I mean, I, I know I took you on a tangent there. So, the first point was what, um, of what we can do now is set up a business plan. Exactly. Yeah. So that's to me, um, you know, one of the really important things um, I, I would say. I mean, you know, as part of a business plan, um, you know, companies do a SWOT. So a SWOT is a fairly structured approach to, you know, with the different aspects, strengths and weaknesses, which is the internal stuff, opportunities, threats, the external stuff. So going through that time uh, tested um, methodology of, you know, analyzing the business, you might do some surveys through Server Monkey, uh, speaking to some of your clients, but you know, doing a really good analysis of what's going on in the marketplace, particularly now, and trying to get a sense of you know whether people are thinking differently and yep. what new opportunities have come about. Gotcha. Perfect. Anything else that you recommend us doing right now to you know uh, react in a way or prepare for the future? Um, well, look, in terms of things, you know, I would say to people to do, to do right now, um, one of the things I, I strongly recommend to anyone is the importance of ongoing education, you know, and um, I guess the field I work in, I, I need to do that, but I also particularly love it. I mean, you know, the, the benefit of reading books um, regularly can't be underestimated. I've heard it said that you know, any sort of really successful person is reading on average 24 books a year, which is one every two weeks. And it sounds like a lot, but you know, if you can uh, undertake to read, um, you know, 15 pages a day, yep. um, you know, you're, you're going to kind of get there. 
Yeah. And you've got um, audio books these days as well. Yeah, exactly right. You know, Audible is such an important thing. And you can, you know, you can listen to it while you're walking, doing your exercise, which I do prolifically, yep. or driving and all yep. of that. So a book that I've come back to just recently, and, and I still think it's arguably the greatest business book out there, personal opinion, is, is Think and Grow Rich. Ah, and it's just got Napoleon so Hill. many, yeah, it's just got, it was written in 1935. Uh, you probably know the story, uh, you know, yeah. Andrew Carnegie said to him, well, you know, I'll be your mentor, but it's, you're going to have to give me 20 years of your life. So Ooh, he took yeah. 25 years to write the book. Wow. And there's just so many layers in the book. And I reckon yeah. it's the kind of book, if you, you know, listen to ch one chapter a day, you could keep listening to it for a whole year and you keep learning yeah. new stuff every day. Yeah. So it's, it's just cool. inspirational. So it's a great book, but I just say to people, you know, read, you get inspiration. Uh, you get confidence, um, you get ideas. It's just so much good stuff. You know, you can have a coach or a mentor, but all of these people, uh, you know, have been successful and created the great books that some of which I've mentioned. They just give you, you know, so much that um, is going to give you the ideas to improve. Um, very quickly, a few other things. Sure. Um, we all know that cash is so important in a business. Yeah. And I really think that preparing a cash flow forecast for the next three three months and keeping it going on an ongoing rolling basis, you know, so every week I say to people, wow. um, you know, update your cash forecast for the next three months. So that if you're going to run out of cash at any time in the next three months, using your best estimates, understand in some businesses, it's more difficult to, to get accurate information. But, you know, if you've got a business that has a level of predictability, get your bookkeeper slash accountant to prepare a cash forecast every single week. First thing on a Monday, look at your cash forecast. When am I going to run out of cash? You know, so if you if you need to panic, at least you're panicking about you know reality and yeah. not just free floating anxiety. Yeah. Um, and you know, getting um, that it's a bit like a plan. You know, it's like projecting forward. What's going to happen? How can I um, you know get the cash if I run out of cash in say two months time? Yeah. So yeah. I think that's really critical uh, at the moment. Um, Another sort of thing that's really important um, for people who are aware of the numbers, and I think it's critical for all owners to know the numbers, is just to be aware in the current environment, now that you've cut a bunch of costs, what's your new break even? How much do you need to sell each day, each week, in order to cover your, your overheads? Right, yep. So, you know, a lot of your, your variable overheads, like the cost of materials or contract labour, might disappear or, or reduce. But you've got fixed overheads, you know, and your rent is going to still be there and a lot of your wages. So with your new cost structure, what does that mean for your new break even? Yep. Do you know that? Do you communicate it to your team? Do you come up with strategies of saying we all, our biggest focus is selling this amount of product. Otherwise, we're going to be underwater. Yep. And even with all the government um, assistance, we're going to be losing money and eventually going to have to shut down. So yep. if everyone is on the same page, what your break even is, you can you can do some amazing things yeah and i would just say one final thing is i almost think the best thing you can do as a team is getting to brainstorming sending us aside time for you know the, the people in your organization who have got you know the best ideas sitting down and just you know creating some sort of a mind map of all the opportunities out there yeah. and just you know sharing collaborating uh, and coming up with ideas, you know, brainstorming is is a form of strategy because everyone's looking at opportunities. That's and right. That's the best way to get everyone's ideas and put it on a piece of paper, and then I guess by uh, process of discussion and, and elimination, you'll come up with what you and this group of trusted people think are the best opportunities available to you. And I, I love that idea because we we it's so easy to just think that you know if you're the director or the uh, general manager of a company, you know, you just do everything, you make all the decisions, yeah. but you, you miss a lot of great opportunities and great creative ideas that are just not in your field of vision and other people will come at it from a different angle. And what a great way to incorporate everything that everybody has to say. Exactly. Yeah. Just because they, you know, they don't own the business doesn't mean they, doesn't don't, mean they don't have anything positive to say or anything interesting to add or anything creative to, to yeah. bring. And, and you know, that's almost the best, uh, way of, of advancing your strategy is mm -hmm. setting aside discrete time, you know, I spoke, I spoke about 40% of the owner's time to really uh, brainstorm and to, you know, share ideas and to, uh, you know, get the research done to find out 
uh, you know, what you can do differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. exciting and, stuff. And, and as you say, I mean, this is not, you know, we will have similar times, not exactly the same, but history repeats itself and these type of situations arise all the time. So if exactly. we can put, it, put into place these sound principles yeah. for how we work and how we run our businesses, we can future-proof them for any situation. Exactly right. And, you know, I just want to repeat because I think it's so important. If the owners of the businesses can embrace two aspects, first of all, the whole concept of planning, be it a strategic, you know, business plan or a strategic plan or 90-day plans, you know, it's just like if you go on holiday or an overseas trip, yeah. you don't just kind of turn up at the airport and say, well, what, which plan should I get on today? It's like, right, you yeah. know, you're very deliberate. Yeah. And that's your holiday. Your yeah. business is more important than your holiday. <laughs> and so many business owners don't plan, that's you know, true. and yeah. it's like, it's actually quite astounding if you think about it. Yeah. And then finding the time to work on the business. So, yeah. you know, having a plan and having 40% of the owner's time devoted to uh, working on the business, the strategy stuff, the big picture, yeah. that will be, you know, those two things will transform That'd any business in my opinion. So it's almost like having a plan and implementing the plan. Well, you know yeah. the old thing, uh, <laughs> we've all heard the cliche, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Absolutely. And I'd love to hear more, maybe if you can give the audience a bit more insight into what your business does and what your target market is or your ideal customer is, just in case anybody wants to, to reach out. Yeah, so thanks for that opportunity, Darren. Um, I'm um, very focused on uh, working with companies with turnover between one and 10 million uh, turnover. Sure. Uh, and that typically uh, represents companies, if you like, between five and 50 employees. Right. Um, you know, it's an alternative measure. Um, and, and the companies that I work with best are Business owners who are kind of ambitious, their business is growing, but they kind of they run out of ideas of what to do next. You know, they don't have good structure, uh, and they're always kind of complaining that you know they're working long hours, uh, their business environment is becoming competitive. Uh, they know they need to change, but often they you know they don't know how to change. Yeah. Um, and you know it, the, the common I, I guess uh, reasons for companies reaching out to me. To me, is either you know issues around time, or their team, or uh, or their profits or their money. Yep. So yeah, companies that are really committed to to being better, um, because I do speak to a lot of owners. They think they want to change. You start working with them, and you soon understand that they like the concept, but uh, they're not so committed to the, the hard Doing work. The work. <laughs> so for me, yeah, it's working with companies that are really committed to change in that sort of um, size range that I spoke about. In terms of an industry niche, um, I think of my niche more being around uh, the type of work I do. So mm -hmm. I'm not a generalist in the services I provide. I'm very much around strategic planning, helping companies implement the plan um, by doing 90-day plans. So, you know, how do we make the uh, strategic plan actionable? And then, you know, some accountability. Uh, and then also reviewing the numbers regularly, which is you know where I come from. So making sure that uh, we're getting outcomes from the work we do together. Because I always like to be able to say to a client, let's see where we're at today. Yeah. Uh, we work together. Let's get an uplift of a certain percentage. You know, I say to companies, if you work with me for six months and do all the work, uh, I can guarantee you you'll get at least a 20% improvement in your in your bottom line. Wow, fantastic. And, and I believe that. The problem is not a lot of people do all the work, right? That's right. Yeah. But believe me, if you do all the work, you can get outcomes. Now, this stuff, it is rocket science and it isn't. You know the old truth of, um, um, uh, what's, a, what's the thing? Um, um, common sense is not a common thing. <laughs> you know? uh, and and yeah. th that applies in business as much <laughs> as anything. It's like the stuff that looks easy is often the things that business owners neglect. And, That's uh, right don't go anywhere that's right and we also tend to take um things for granted as well we take a lot of yes. things for granted in general yep. yeah absolutely which is another another trap to fall into yeah yeah fantastic and and if people want to actually contact you what's your website peter uh, my website is uh pair planning p-a-i-r p-l-a-n-n-i-n-g right dot com fantastic all right awesome and i'll, yeah. I'll link um I'll link that in the show notes as well. That'd be wonderful. Um, and um, I always like to ask one last question. And you like, it's sometimes a question that's not 
not people aren't prepared for, but I know you've given us so many tips and two of those tips being, you know, that stuck out in my mind, prepare a business plan and actually abide by it and do the work yes. and work on the business. Yes. But I'd like to kind of ask you, what's one or two tips that come out, just come to your mind spontaneously in these times to help people um, on their journey? Anything that comes to your mind? Um, look, I think uh, one of the things that is, is more important than ever, and I think the government's recognised it, is the importance in, in difficult times of not having your first reaction to get rid of staff. Right. Now, finding good staff, training good staff, is yep. such a difficult thing to achieve. Yep. And, so um, you know, if you get rid of the muscle, you know, as, a, as a, an analogy uh, in your organisation, your business is going to die. Yeah. And I think the importance of creating a cohesive team, of getting everyone on the same page, of all working towards common results, of sharing the benefits that accrue in the organisation, um, uh, you know, of, of getting everyone involved in the planning of the business, it's just such an important thing. And, you know, it's the old, again, a cliche of, you know, the most important asset in any business walks in on two feet each day. Yeah. And, um, you know, undervaluing your staff, you will do at your own peril. And I just say, you know, love the people you work with, uh, treat them well, uh, embrace them, uh, trust them, um, delegate, um, and, you know, your company will thrive. And yeah. I think, you know, the government's kind of got right, I believe, with the job um, the job keeper. You know, yeah. Companies, it's much better to keep companies warm than let them go cold. Um, I've got a daughter who works in the oil industry in, in the UK and she was telling me, I think it costs something like $50 million to restart an oil platform that's gone cold. Wow. So you can either have a cold oil platform or you can keep it warm when, you know, it's, it's just ready to go, but it's not producing. And I would say the same about a business. It's like, yeah. you know, if you have a, a difficult time, uh, don't switch off everything and, um, and start again. You've got a great team. The value in most organisations is the team and nurture those people, treat them well, um, you know, and, um, and you'll get good outcomes. That's probably my most enduring um, view on, on the business world. Fantastic. I think that is very, very sound advice. I think that is Thank just you. brilliant. Um, and I 100% agree with you. Like I always say, your people are more important than your customers to a degree. Because yes, they without are. Your because people, without your people, you can't uh, work with them. Don't have anything. <laughs> yeah, your, your people have to come first. That's right. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, really I just think, um, yeah, organizations find out soon enough. You know, if yeah. you don't show your staff the right level of, um, of respect, um, your organization is much the weaker for it. Absolutely. Well, Peter, thank you very much. That was a superb session, and I've learned a hell of a lot. And I hope that well, the, uh, I, I, I audience has every, as well. every bit as much as you, Darren. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my absolute pleasure. And for, uh, again, anybody out there that wants to get some advice, um, and as you know, Peter offers a complimentary introductory session, so please get in touch with him. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I'm very generous with my time, probably too much, though, but you know, I love <laughs> working with business owners, so it's something I do with great joy. So I'm very happy to speak to anyone. You know, maybe go through that six-question strategy piece come up with a, a tangible outcome. It'll give you something to think about. Fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you again. And for all the audience, we hope you enjoyed that show. And we'll be back in a couple of days for episode 40. So bye for now.